Thanks for tuning in to our YouTube channel, Debt Bites. I'm Michael Bovey with Consumer Recovery Network. And I've got a guest today that we're going to be covering student loans, um, issues with both federal and private student loans. And anyway, uh, with me today is Andrew Weber. Andrew, um, you're pretty unique as far as, in my opinion, and I'm pretty hypercritical of all things debt relief. And I've found you to be pretty unique in the debt relief space and your focus. So uh, thank you for joining me today. Why don't you tell people tuning in a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background and experience? Sure. Um, I've been a debt negotiator for about seven years, and uh, in that time I've worked on unsecured debt of all types. Uh, and just recently, in the last three years, I've started focusing on private student loans. And I also did a little federal loan counseling for a while, uh, learned quite a bit about that industry and a lot of the problems with that industry, which we've discussed before. And I have federal loans of my own as well as private loans of my own. So that's kind of where I started learning about that uh, four or five years ago. I've been a certified credit counselor through the National Association of Certified Credit Counselors for about uh, five years now. And just recently got my uh, student loan counselor certification through them as well, which is one of the first agencies to offer any type of student loan certification. So wanted to kind of take the next step with, um, with being a student loan counselor and add some more legitimacy and, and kind of round out my knowledge base there. But it's something that I really never thought I would, uh, I would be into. I it kind of developed out of my own uh, student loan issues and seeing how difficult it was to navigate both federal and private student loan issues. And um, yeah, I started doing this back in 2009 when I was laid off from the Palm Beach County Courthouse and started working in, in the industry just as uh, something to try that was different. And seven years later, I still really enjoy it. I still love negotiating and, and delivering results for my clients and being part of a broader student loan discussion and, and a broader personal finance discussion as well. Well, and that's cool because that's how I came across you. You are uh, just like me. Uh, you're very motivated, it appears. And of course, now that I know you more, uh, it's very obvious that you want to be part of the broader discussion. You want to be informative. You want to help people find the direction that they need because sometimes that's really all people need is an answer to a simple question. And you've seemed to be, uh, and you've come across on other websites that you're available and you, you volunteer in all for all intents and purposes. So uh, it attracted me to you and I'm certainly happy that we're going to be doing this video and talking about some of the main issues that concern a lot of student loan borrowers one of the first things that people that I have come to my site or that call into our hotline, you know, because we help people resolve student loans, uh, they can press four on the hotline and now uh, soon they'll be reaching you actually. But um, that's a free consult. One of the first things that I, I get from them is it's like, okay, so how do I tell the difference between my loans? I want to know which ones are federal and which ones are private. And obviously NSLDS gives them that option. How do you encourage people to first start discovering what types of loans they have? Well, that's really the first step I recommend as well, the National Student Loan Database System. It does show all of your federal loans, and you have to create an FSA ID before you actually can log into that system, which is a secure login that makes sure no one else can log in on your behalf. But with that FSA ID, you can log into both the National Student Loan Database or the studentloans.gov website. And you know, studentloans.gov has a way you can access your federal loans there as well. Once you log in, you just click Repayment Estimator and then click View or Add My Loans, and that's going to show your loans as well. But both databases offer different types of information. So the National Student Loan Database is going to offer a more comprehensive loan history, um, more about your loan guarantor and the history of your loans, but they don't show your interest rates. That's the one key piece of information that you do not show on that database. So studentloans.gov actually will give you a weighted average of your interest rates, which obviously is very helpful in determining your options going forward. And then you can kind of look at those databases and see which loans are showing up and which loans are not. And nine times out of ten, the loans that are not showing up are private student loans. There are errors every once in a while with uh, the federal loan database where something will not show up, but usually when a loan isn't showing up, it does mean it's a private loan. So once you see that, then you want to check your, your uh, free credit report at annualcreditreport.com to see what other loans are showing up on your credit report. And there are also some indicators on your credit report of whether a loan is federal or private. So if you see something that says, like, uh, government claim, obviously that means it's, it's a federal government-backed loan. If you see something that says a, a charge-off, for instance, that's the, the term for a default for an unsecured debt, 
that means that's a private student loan. And there are some other kind of tells you can see on the, on the free credit report, which will let you know whether the loans are federal or private. But basically, by comparing the, the credit report to your student loan database, you're going to be able to tell which loans are federal and which, which ones are private by which ones are showing up on the federal loan databases. Awesome. Okay. What are some of the most common um, ways that a consumer can either get a loan out of default or bring uh, you know, together all of their federal backed student loans like consolidation, IBRs? Talk a little bit about some of the options that you typically walk people through um, for their federal loans. Sure. I mean, there's really kind of a toolbox of federal loan options, and it should be looked at as um, you know tools that can work together to create an ideal outcome. Um, a lot of times, people will do direct consolidation to make their loan repayment easier, especially if they have multiple loan servicers and they're making multiple payments on their federal loans each month. That can be kind of difficult to keep track of. So, direct consolidation can help with that by adding those loans into one consolidated loan with two parts, an unsubsidized part and a subsidized part, and that's going to keep a weighted average of your interest rates. So it's not going to change your interest rates. I believe it's actually rounded up to the nearest one-eighth of a percent uh, to be technical, but it's not much of an increase, and usually the benefit of direct consolidation is, is worth it. Um, for some people, direct consolidation is the best way to get out of default. So you can actually consolidate defaulted federal loans by doing direct consolidation, although you have to choose one of the payment plans based on income at the same time. And that's one thing that you know I've dealt with a lot of federal loan debt collectors. They never mention that. They will never tell people that direct consolidation is one of their options. They prefer for people to do the, the rehabilitation program, which can still be a valid option in its own right. It takes about 9 to 12 months though, whereas direct consolidation can have you current in about 2 or 3 months. So it's uh, really something to consider as far as whether the benefits of rehabilitation are going to be worth making those payments over 9 to 12 months, which are on the IVR scale by the way. And um, with rehabilitation as well, they will remove the default notation from your credit report. Although that is a little bit oversold as far as the benefits because most like mortgage lenders, for instance, just want to see that your defaults are cured in some way, whether they're consolidated, and, and which means the old loans are paid off and a new balance of the same amount is created, or whether they're brought current for rehabilitation. The, the mortgage lenders and auto lenders are just looking for those defaults to be taken care of. So a lot of times debt collectors are going to oversell that um, the credit benefit of having the default notation removed. What they don't tell you is that those initial late hits going up to the default are going to stay there and still negatively affect your credit. So direct consolidation, I think, is still a good option. It still helps build your credit back up once you've had a federal loan default. One of the, the drawbacks of direct consolidation, though, is that um, any default fees or late fees that were added, which can be very substantial, will be added to the new direct consolidation balance. And a lot of times with rehabilitation, that will also happen. But some collection agencies are offering the uh, ability to remove those default fees at the end of the rehabilitation period. Um, with that said, there have been a lot of issues with rehabilitation because they're facilitated by loan servicers, uh, an industry which has the most complaints every year out of any industry in the United States. So it's a great program, but sometimes it's not implemented properly. And for that reason, direct consolidation can be a little bit easier. Um, as far as the payment plans based on income, they're, they're really a lifesaver for a lot of people. And there was a new payment plan that just came out in December called Repay, which is a revised pay as you earn. And that is going to base payments off of 10% of your discretionary income based on either two recent tax, excuse me, two recent pay stubs or your most recent tax return. And the drawback of the income based plan and the repay plan is that uh, it can add a lot of interest over time. There are some limitations built into these programs that limit the amount of interest that accrues, but when doing these estimates for, for borrowers, I can still see you know, the difference between an IBR plan and a standard plan, for instance, being you know, much more over time for a borrower that had a six-figure account. It was another $100,000 as far as total repayment from the standard plan versus the IBR plan. So Isn't there that a... Uh... Like an element for the repay, though, uh, maybe you want to talk about if you're married uh, and how both incomes, then the household income gets factored in 
to what you can afford to pay right. as where without the repay and an IBR, it's your individual income? So that, that's one of the big differences between repay and IBR is uh, the way your tax filing status is considered. So on IBR, if you file your taxes separately and you're married, they are only going to go off of your individual income and they're still going to count any dependents that you have uh, that you're filing taxes uh, with. So that can make the difference between a much larger payment and a much more reasonable payment. Whereas, this, and this is one of the drawbacks with repay, the new plan, no matter what type of tax filing status you're on, if you're married, whether it's separate or you're, you're married filing jointly, they are going to go off of your, your joint household income unless you're actually physically separated and you can prove that. And I'm not sure how they require you to prove that. but. Um, for a lot of people before uh, repay, the, the way to get around the joint repayment issue was just filing taxes separately and that would result in a much lower payment on IBR. That's not the case with repay. Uh, so someone that is looking at uh, income based or, or income related payment plans may see a lower payment on paper with repay if it's 10% of their, their income but they have to realize that it's going to be 10% of their joint income, uh, their combined household income rather than IBR, which could be 10% of just their individual income. Okay, cool. So you mentioned something, and it's one of my questions that I had prepared for you, because you've been doing this for seven years, you've been working with all the servicers, the debt collectors for private loans, whatever the uh, activity that you're involved in. After that much time, and as, as the uh, student loan um, iceberg, let's say, as more of it and more of it has become exposed in the media and press, how big of a problem it truly is. We've seen some changes, right? We've seen awareness um, and, and even regulatory activity. So in your experience, if you don't mind sharing with viewers, what changes? So, so my question is, is, do you see an improvement in loan services uh, and, and servicers informing people accurately about their options and or uh, what is available to them with options with loans that are in default for giving some of those, you know, 15, 18, as much as 18 percent um, collection fees, is there an improvement, or is it just have we not gotten there yet? There definitely have been some improvements, but I, I feel like there are still uh, endemic issues with just loan servicing in general, regardless of who the loan servicers are. Uh, with that said, some loan servicers are better than others, and some have improved more than others in the last several years. Uh, I remember working with a, a certain loan servicer where. They were really pushing for a forbearance um, for my client rather than an income-based repayment program. We had to really press them to discuss the program and how they could apply for it. I mean, that's not the way it should be. You know, a forbearance is going to cause a lot of interest to accrue. It's really a last resort. It's better than going into default, but it's a last resort as far as payment options. So some loan servicers are still pushing the, the fast and easy option. And part of that is, you know, their their workload, the way they're trying to manage their calls and and shorten their phone calls or keep the times down because a forbearance can be applied for over the phone very quickly. It takes a few minutes. Uh, an IBR plan has to go through an, a paper application and it involves some more work for the loan servicer. So that's kind of the incentive they have to not discuss that as much. But I have seen some loan servicers like Nelnet and Great Lakes, for example. Uh, Nelnet is my own federal loan servicer. And there's been a, a market improvement in the way they discuss the IBR program and the other income-related payment plans in the last few years. And it seems like uh, Nelnet and Great Lakes have really kind of taken charge with that. They will email people about uh, their different repayment options. If you sign up for a forbearance, which I actually did on my own loans recently for a couple months, and I don't recommend doing a forbearance for more than uh, two or three months at a time. But when I did that, they actually read to me the disclosure about you know, the IBR plan and how I can stay on that and basically were recommending the IBR plan over forbearance, which was definitely an improvement. It used to be the other way around. Um, um, so Navient has um, been a loan servicer where there really has been a lot of issues. They spun off from Sally Mae, which you know, was actually a rebranding attempt in my opinion. Sally Mae themselves had a lot of federal loan investigations, some lawsuits, uh, even one from the Department of Justice. And I believe that they created Navient as a rebranding attempt. And it's been pretty successful. People don't know that Navient is basically the same group of companies as Sally Mae. The executive, uh, I think the CEO from Sally Mae is now on the board of Navient. It's really the same people. They have offices in a few different states now, but it's really the same group of people. 
And consequently, they have the same issues that Sally May had before, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of improvement there. I mean, by far, the loan servicer I have the most issues with is Navient. Um, they're also one of the largest, and they, they are also the largest private student loan lender, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, with Navient, they've had a recent um, federal loan investigation from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for issues with their federal loan servicing. And just recently, in the last couple of weeks, I'm sure you saw this as well, they were overcharging um, active duty military members over the cap of interest they're allowed to charge. I mean, you don't get much lower than that. Um, you know, it seems like that's a systemic problem within Navient where, you know, there really are these issues they cannot resolve. I think they're putting profits before um, their, their purpose and their, their mission, which is to service federal loans in an accurate and reasonable way. Um, so we're still seeing some issues with that. So um, going back to consolidating, right? So if you consolidate, you actually get to pick your servicer. So not to put you on the spot, but to actually put you on the spot. Uh, if you had your choice of student loan servicers, who would you pick? Uh, Navient. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> never, never pick Navient ever. Do, do not ever do that for any reason. Um, besides that, you know, it's kind of a coin toss. I mean, again, there are issues with, with loan servicers that are endemic to them as an industry and not just individually. But I really like Nelnet and Great Lakes a lot. I, I've had a lot of experience working with both of them or at least sending applications to both of them. I, I don't work directly with them in any way, of course. Um, but Nelnet is my own federal loan servicer. I've had a lot of good experiences with them. I haven't had any, any major issues with them either. And Great Lakes has also done a very good job of consolidating um, people's loans, going through the applications in a very um, you know, fast manner and getting them done accurately. Uh, their customer service is great and I think they also have less complaints overall. Um, Fed loan servicing, you know, kind of a, a mixed bag. I've, I've had some issues with them before. The servicer I was just discussing that, that was pushing forbearance over IBR, that, that was Fed loan servicing. Um, and again, sometimes it can just be the agent that you get on the phone. So I, I recommend for people just kind of as an aside, if you're having a hard time or having a difficult conversation with your loan servicer, maybe just call back and try to get to somebody else. Uh, usually they're not assigned to your account and that can make all the difference. So maybe I just got a person who was having a bad day, but um, Fed Loan Servicing does have more of a mixed record, although they are the designated public service loan forgiveness servicer. So if you have loans that you're applying for public service loan forgiveness with, you will eventually end up with Fed Loan Servicing. Um, but aside from that, um, just don't go with Navient. Okay, so it's kind of a mixed bag, right? We've got all this heightened awareness about the student loan. Um, again, more and more uh, massive amount of people unable to repay debt, uh, all of these things that circle around servicing and Service Member Civil Relief Act and you know violations of that. So there's still a lot of work to be done, it sounds like, in your opinion. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's hard to see how they're going to make any one solution or change to really fix the industry. It really needs an overhaul. There is the argument that loan servicing should be done by the government. Obviously, there are some issues with government bureaucracy and government programs as well, but and maybe it's something that's at least worth experimenting with because um, it introduces a, you know, a for-profit factor when it's done by these for-profit companies Maybe that's not the best fit for federal loan servicing. For I borrowing. think more attention needs to be paid to that um, because you brought up, you know, private lenders, and of course that market started to dry up over a decade ago. Uh, yeah. But I did want to ask you if you recommend that people consolidate out of fell loans. You know, the, the loans that were federally backed but were issued and/or made or underwritten by banks like Chase and whatnot. What are your thoughts on that? No, I, I think that's a good idea, just as a matter of principle. Um, a lot of FFEL loans are not eligible for certain payment plans like pay as you earn, so you have to go through direct consolidation to be able to apply for payment plans like that if you have an FFEL loan. Um, the other thing kind of goes back to uh, what we were just talking about. You know, Navient and formerly Sally Mae is the majority owner of all FFEL loans. They have bought out a lot of the Chase loans and a lot of the other um, banks that were involved in that, in the FFEL program before it was discontinued in, I believe, 2009. Um, so there's really no good reason to preserve your FFEL loans, and there are some good reasons to convert those to direct as far as more access to different payment plans and things like that. 
Um, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of people don't realize that their FFEL consolidation loans, which may just be one loan showing up on their, on their uh, database or their credit report, those can be consolidated into a direct consolidation loan even though it's just one loan. So, you know, you hear a lot, well, you, you can't consolidate a loan that's already been consolidated. That's only true for direct loans, direct consolidation loans, if there's no additional loans to add. But for FFBL loans, if it's a single FFBL consolidation, you can convert that to a direct loan through direct consolidation to apply for pay as you earn or some of the other payment plans. Which is almost necessary for some people who have hit, hit the skids, you know, financially. Let's jump into another question. And this has to do with uh, folks like me, parents uh, with kids of college school age. So um, Parent Plus loans have never qualified for income-based repayment or IBR plans, um, pay as you earn, but you can consolidate them. So how much of a benefit do you see in consolidating Parent Plus loans? Well, it, you know, it doesn't make a lot of difference unless you're trying to apply for the income contingent repayment plan, which is the one income-related payment plan that Parent PLUS loans are allowed to apply for, but you do have to go through direct consolidation to apply for those. Whereas with other direct loans, you can apply for IBR without going through direct consolidation, and maybe direct consolidation still makes sense as far as organizing your loans or simplifying your repayment. But for Parent PLUS loans, they have to go through direct consolidation to apply for income contingent repayment, which is based on 20% of your discretionary income. So it's a little more than the other repayment plans based on income or related to your income, but it's still better for a lot of people than, say, the graduated payment plan, which has a lot of interest accrual over time, or the standard plan, which is based on around 1% of your loan balance. Some of those Parent PLUS loan balances can be pretty large, and the standard payment plan can be very difficult for people to apply for or to, to stay on. Uh, and then income contingent repayment also does have some, some limitations on interest accrual as well. So we'll actually see people that are paying less over time on the income contingent plan than a different payment plan. So it, it can make sense from that standpoint. But one of the key things to remember is that only Parent PLUS loans that were originated after June 1st, 2006 can go through direct consolidation and then get on to income contingent repayment. Uh, Parent PLUS loans from before that date can go through direct consolidation, but they cannot easily be put on to income contingent repayment. Cool. How much does age play into what you decide to do with Parent PLUS loans or even private student loans? Well, I, I think it's really uh, two separate things. Um, with, with private student loans, you, you want to really obviously look at how much you're able to put towards your, your retirement and not take funds out of your retirement. I mean, that, that is more important than, than paying off any loan. So you want to make sure that your, your loan repayment is not affecting your retirement plans or your retirement budget. And then on the side of Parent PLUS loans or federal loans, there's, there's more flexibility. You know, there are not really the, any type of payment plans like that for private loans. But for Parent PLUS loans, one thing that we've done is help borrowers apply for the income contingent plan when they're reaching retirement because that's only going to go off of their taxable income. A lot of people have retirement income that is, that is not taxed or it's tax exempt, so it does not factor into that income contingent equation, meaning they get a lower monthly payment because that income is not being accounted for in the income contingent repayment um, equation. So for some people that are getting close to retirement, one thing that we've done for Parent PLUS loans specifically is help them apply for the graduated payment plan, which I just mentioned is a bad long-term plan. But in the short term, it can make sense because it's going to be lower than the standard plan for at least four to six years. And the graduated payment plan is kind of a precursor to these income-related payment plans. It automatically goes up by about 17% of the monthly payment. Uh, that increases every two years. So for two to six years, you're going to have probably a lower payment than your standard plan. But after that, it really starts to increase. And the way that the payment plan is structured, it always ends up having the most interest accrual and being the most expensive plan over time. So not a good long-term option, but you can use kind of a combination of these payment plans to build your federal loan strategy. So, for example, you can do the graduated repayment plan for, say, two to four years to get a break on payments and then switch over to income contingent repayment after going through direct consolidation when you're approaching retirement. 
and then you can make sure that you're, you're getting the lowest payment possible and also limiting some of the interest that's going to accrue. And the good thing about the income contingent plan is it does have a 25-year forgiveness element uh, that is taxable. Uh, at least as of now, there have been some, some resolutions introduced in Congress to try to make IBR and ICR forgiveness uh, tax exempt. We're not sure if that's going to happen or not. But as of now, it, it is taxable. However, you don't have to do it. You can just stop the income contingent plan maybe 10 years into it and then go back on to it the next year. And that would interrupt that 25 consecutive years you need to actually get that forgiveness. So but, uh, yeah. what's really cool, and I want to point this out to anybody watching this video, is, is that you're not going to get that kind of strategic response to your particular situation, your lifestyle, your needs on a right now basis and a moving forward where you're going to be in five years, six years, because these loans last for a long time. Um, you don't get that from your servicer. You don't get that from a collector if you're in default and you're starting to try and strategize some of these things. So that's really cool um, that you... And I would just add that um, you know you don't get that from the average debt relief company either. We haven't talked about those yet, but they're mainly trying to put people into a consolidation, an income-based plan or an income-related payment plan using different forms of deceptive marketing, making it sound like they're the only way you can apply for those, using terms like Obama loan forgiveness, which doesn't exist, um, or you know enrollment fees, and they basically have no value to provide other than the fact that they're taking these free federal programs and wrapping them up in deception to get you to pay an upfront fee. And the difference between those kind of companies and a legitimate certified student loan counselor is what you just mentioned. It's a comprehensive game plan looking at your future and going forward and how you can use these programs in combination. And you're not going to get that from your servicer, as you mentioned, and you're definitely not going to get it from a debt relief company, at least from most debt relief companies. Cookie cutter doesn't work. Never has. I've never been a big fan. You can't. Uh, you can. You can try and mass market cookie cutter and have the lowest denominator kind of employee uh, answering the phone on the other line, uh, but they're not trained to think creatively and show you how to get the best out of uh, your situation. That might already suck. Right. So it really is important to take the time to get something right. Your next decision. Uh, to set you up for your future. So, all right. So, listen, Andrew, you're awesome, right? You're so sincere in the things, and I've said this already, but uh, there's no mistaking your sincerity when you're out there to help people with federal loans. It's not even like you take them on as clients anymore necessarily, but you're very evidently available to people, both in the comments here that you've committed to and on your own website. Uh, I see you and I've, I've come across you on other websites, and you're now spending some time on my site, the, the consumerrecoverynetwork.com website. So thank you so much for being here to share that information about federal loans. We're gonna move into another segment now um, for private loans, but we'll put a put a cap on this one. Thanks thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been great to be, uh, great to be a, a part of this too, so thank you. Awesome.